In America, for less than $200, you can go get any business registered at the City Hall and call yourself a CEO. You can even get a business card and call yourself a CEO and give you a business card and say, man, I'm a CEO. But you know when you're a real CEO? When hundreds of other people call you a CEO because you've earned the right for other people to see you as a CEO. So today, today, before you become a CEO, one must act, behave, walk, talk, think like a CEO before you become a CEO. Way before I became a CEO, I worked on thinking like a CEO, walking like a CEO, asking myself how I would make a decision like a CEO, and then I became a CEO. And then once I was called a CEO, years later, other people started seeing me as a CEO, then the rest was history. So, today, qualities of a great CEO, and I'm telling this from a lot of my personal mistakes on what can help you out for one day being a CEO, uh, and, and maybe one day you aspire to become a great CEO, but regardless if you ever plan on becoming a, a great CEO or not, you're gonna learn a lot of things you can do to help yourself with your leadership ability. So I've got 19 different points to give you, and I'll get right into it. Point number one, point number one. Great CEOs know how to manage their ego. Let me explain. Nobody becomes a CEO who doesn't have an ego. Nobody, not a single soul becomes a CEO who doesn't have an ego. Nobody becomes a president of the United States without being a little bit mentally off to believe you have the best processor to make decisions. You got somewhat of an ego, right? So you gotta realize people who don't have egos don't wanna be presidents. So there's nothing wrong with having a big ego, but you gotta learn how to manage your own ego because if you don't control your ego, you're definitely in trouble. Let me explain why. When you become very successful and you start making a lot of money and everybody knows you and you have fame and all this other stuff, there's something that happens. And let me tell you what that one thing is. It's called you are flooded with compliments. Okay, you are flooded with compliments. Let me give you the compliments. Oh, you're so amazing. Oh, you're so ridiculously good. Oh, you're better than this. Oh, you're better than that. And so many people are gonna feed you this stuff because you're surrounded around people that are afraid of the decisions you could make to fire them. So everybody wants to tell you how amazing you are, right? Let me tell you, 90% of it is lies, okay? Just, just want you to know that because most people are not gonna tell you what you need to hear. If you have a small circle of people around you that are telling you the truth, you need that because that's gonna help you manage your ego. If you don't ever, if you no longer talk to the guys that tell you off and are not afraid to tell you things you need to hear, and I'm talking about small board that you have or mentors that you have that are willing to sit you and tell you, otherwise you're gonna be in trouble. I've seen this happen in sales many times. I've been dealing with salespeople for a long time. They start making money. Everybody starts telling them how amazing they are. They're no longer coachable, not willing to learn. They don't listen to anything they'll tell you. They know every single thing because they already know it. They forgot how to manage their own ego. Now that's step number one. Let me tell you step number two of a great CEO. They have a way of finally realizing that they need to get a touch of humility in them. Here's why. You know why humility helps? Because other people want to work with you. If you don't have humility, you can't bring people together. If you don't have humility, people who disagree with you don't want to do business with you. If you don't have humility, you can't have an environment with a lot of different personalities because they have to be in a certain set of personality to be able to work with you. Humility is extremely needed. Point number three, CEOs are extremely driven. What I did last week, can you give me that packet right there on uh, uh, the, the, the bag right there? Yes, just give me the whole bag. No, no, give me the whole bag, yeah. So I brought uh, all the, Edgar, you can say hi to everybody. Everybody doesn't, this is Edgar, okay? Hi. Edgar, new, uh, new teammate of ours for about a month and a half. So uh, uh, last, uh, um, two weeks ago, I invited uh, some of the biggest insurance companies in the world, CEOs, all these different people showed up. We took them to a nice dinner at Capitol Grill uh, in uh, 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 Dallas at Crescent, which is my favorite building in the world is a Crescent. Fascinating, I just wrote a, Last five years, I wrote this book. It's a fiction book. It's my first fiction book I've ever written. The entire book was inspired by this building, the Crescent. The setting is at a building that looks like the Crescent. So we had dinner at Capitol Grill, and I brought them to dinner, and normally in the insurance industry, they pay for our dinner. I pay for everybody. That's not a cheap dinner, a few thousand dollars. Then the following day, the Crescent has a 17th floor. It's a country, it's a club where President Bush goes and other presidents, many different presidents, both on the left and the right, have been to this club. And there's a lot of strong billionaires, oil people that go over here. I rented an entire room and I took them over there. We had lunch from eight o'clock in the morning till noon. I presented to them with the 2017 vision. 
when we had this meeting, and it's a room filled with a lot of egos, for a lot of egos, and everybody is products, we sell their products, okay? And they're all multi-billion dollar companies. These are all multi-billion from, ranging from a $10 billion company to a $300 billion company. They're all in the room, and we're presenting all this stuff that I'm sharing with all these guys. This is how the meeting got started, the first thing. I said, I got a gift for you. Typically, these meetings start in a different way, but I got a, I got a surprise for you. I said, first, um, we need to realize that ego is the enemy, and we all need to set aside our egos. If we don't lead with humility and we lead purely with ego, nothing's gonna get done. If you're willing to set aside your egos, we're willing to set aside our egos, hopefully we can do something big together. This doesn't mean I'm negotiating, I'm not gonna stop negotiating, because I'm gonna ask for a bigger contract, but this needs to be set aside. Simple as that, gave it to everybody. We laughed, we had fun, they enjoyed it. Then I give them the next hat here. And this hat doesn't say make America great again. Obviously we're trying to have some humor with these guys. It said, can you zoom in? Can you zoom in and see exactly what it says? It says, make insurance cool again, right? Make insurance cool again. Uh, the reason why I gave him these hats is because there's nothing cool about life insurance. If you've ever been to a life insurance traditional convention with all these insurance companies go to, it's, it's pretty bad when you go to it. So we gave him this hat, everybody starts laughing, make insurance, we took a picture, everybody took the picture again together. And I said, we're gonna make insurance cool again. What's the likelihood of doing that? It's very difficult for a lot of other people, but we're doing it. We made it cool. Millennials love working for our firm. We have multicultural, the average agent in our company is a 34 year old Hispanic female, while America right now is struggling to get Hispanics, multiculturals, and millennials, and Gen Xers to become agents. And we're very good at that. So I gave him this hat, and everyone starts laughing. The next thing we gave him was a phone charger. The phone charger said, Every single time you charge your phone, I want you to think about that we're going to power up the entire industry is what we're gonna be doing. So next time you charge in your phone, think about us because we're probably out there growing the industry. And last but not least, what I gave them was the following. Here's what I gave them. We gave them two cigars, Romeo and Julieta, okay, two cigars. And the reason why we got these two cigars for them, I said the following to them, I said, look, in business, sometimes we end up spending more time with people we're in business with than our own family. Because that's just kind of how business works. You're traveling, you're doing all this other stuff. I said, it's even greater if you can enjoy doing business with people that you enjoy being in business with. And I said, I hope we can take our business relationship from what it is today to a friendship by sharing many different cigars together so you and I can get to know each other. So we make tens of millions of dollars together, but at the same time, we establish a relationship with you as well. Are you open to that? Yes, then we kicked off the meeting. That's how the meeting got started. Now, why am I telling you this? Here's why I'm telling you this. We're extremely driven. Everybody in the room is driven. Everybody's got ego, but we have to figure out a way to set aside the ego and manage this and lead with this for everybody else to open up and say, fair enough, let's do business together. This is one of the things that a CEO has to, a CEO typically starts off with a lot of this because this is what survives and you just wanted to kill everybody and compete and all this stuff. And then you realize, sometimes you're killing your own allies. These are your friends you're killing. You know how there was sometimes you play those video games and you kill the wrong person and you lose? You're killing your own allies. That's not smart because of your ego. We need to lead with this and you need to know how to manage your ego while still being driven, while still knowing you're gonna be dealing with a lot of other driven people. Number four, care for their people. Great CEOs care for their people. If you ask any of the CEOs, like I got a call the other day from a guy I worked with a long time ago, his name is Sevan. Let me tell you what he called me and told me. He called me and he and I were speaking something on the private side. I haven't talked to this guy for the longest time. Uh, and I was mentoring him way, way, way many years ago. He was like family, right? I protected this guy, I looked over him, I wanted to make sure he had a very good uh, life, enjoyed himself, I enjoyed the company of his mom, dad, sister, everybody with his family. Now, certain things happen, he called me, he says, Pat, Every single time I make a decision, I say the following. I say, what would Patrick do in this situation, right? And he said, some of the best times I had in business was working with you. I haven't learned as much as I learned except when I was working with you. Let me tell you why it's so important to care for people. I got another call from a guy named Danny. I won't tell his last name, Danny. He called me, he was in tears. He called me a year and a half ago. And he was in tears. He says, you have no idea how reluctant I've been about calling you uh, because it's been a decade. I said, well, Danny, what's going on? I remember everything about the people that work, I know their stories, because I care for the people, I know their stories. And he says to me, he says, um, Pat, I gotta tell you something, man. 
He, he's quiet. I'm like, why is this guy crying? I haven't talked to you for 10 years. He says, I'm now the president of the bank I work at. I'm doing very well. I am married. I am so happy I can't even tell you. I'm making a multi six figure year income. And I'm here to tell you, everything I'm putting in this leadership position is the stuff I learned when I was working in you, in the business with you. You may be watching this, you're in Malaysia, you're in Brazil. You and I will never meet each other. Possibilities of us meeting each other may be never, right? But you may realize that the only way you will ever be called a great CEO is if you realize the most important product you will ever have as a CEO is the people around you. If you forget that, you're in deep doo-doo, let me tell you. They make you look good. Without them, you're not existent. So if you think the world revolves around you as a CEO, you're in deep trouble. Without them, nothing happens. And by the way, there's fake care, and people can tell, and there's real sincerity and authenticity about you truly caring about the people around you. By the way, most people know how to read through the BS. You truly gotta care about your people. So ask yourself, how often do you care about your people? Do you think about their dreams, their goals, what they want their purpose to become a reality? Are you thinking from that standpoint? If you are, you're gonna end up becoming a pretty solid CEO one day. Number five, human nature, you gotta study human nature. Why human nature? Great CEOs understand human nature because they realized a very, very long time ago their number one product is not technology. I was at a Dallas Cowboys game, they lost to the Packers, tough game, man. Let me tell you, we were at the game, we had box seats, we're with this technology guys, we're doing a bit of a negotiation with them. And a CEO of this company, they did about $100 million last year. So Tom asks him a question about, hey, how long have you been coding? He says, I've never coded in my life. So wait a minute, you sold us, we cut a massive check to you. You've never, he said, I've never coded in my life. How have you never coded? He said, I've never coded in my life. Him and the biz dev guy have never coded in their lives. But they were both good in one thing, human nature. Human nature. Because the number one product is not coding. The number one product is not insurance, annuities, all this other stuff. By the way, if you're a CEO and you know your products very well, you got an edge on everybody else. So don't take this for a moment for you to say, well, thank God, because I know nothing about my product. Uh-uh, that's all, I'm not giving you an out. So don't take the out there, hang on, come back here. You gotta learn the product. But the number one product above all is human nature. You gotta know what happens when people are down, why this person's not all in, why this person's being a little bit forgetful, what's the personal life going, you gotta take them out to lunch and talk to them and say, is everything okay, how's your wife doing, how's you know, such and such doing, are the kids good, how's they, you gotta, this is all the stuff you gotta know about, because it's relationships. Business is purely relationships, right? Number six, comfortable handling contradictions. This is very difficult for a lot of people, let me explain. So anytime I try to develop somebody into becoming a CEO or an entrepreneur, somebody that's running their own business, they are so like, I'm my business only black and it's, it's white. I'm a black and white type of person. And this is the only way I do business, black and white. I'm like, listen, I, I wish life was black and white. My life is not black and white. Life is blue sometimes, it's white sometimes, it's black sometimes, sometimes it's pink, green, purple, sometimes it's colorful, sometimes it's gray. It's very weird. So if you go into business expecting just black and white, you're gonna miss out on 80% of the opportunities. There are some gray areas in business and it's about learning how to deal with contradictions. What am I talking about with contradictions? On one side, one can say, hard work, you know, you gotta work hard to go out there and be successful. 100% true. But the key is working smart is what you gotta become successful. And these guys may be true. Sometimes, some, no, it's only about hard and working hard. No, it's only about working smart. Now, of course you need to work smart and have tools. But if I got a guy that knows how to work hard and manages energy and his health, and he knows how to work smart by having the right tools and people around him, he's gonna kick the other guy's butt that only thinks about working hard, only thinks about working smart. So you gotta learn that there's a lot of contradictions in life and in business. Yo, success, happiness is about living a balanced life. Okay, okay. I mean, what is so balanced about being pregnant and having a kid and 24 seven a woman, all they have to think about is pregnancy, nursing. We have several, I'm okay with you know, people that wanna bring their kids here to work, they're pumping milk all day long. So what, do you, what is the balanced life about it where you're nursing the kids seven, eight times a day and they're pooping and this, your life is not balanced. But let me explain to you, one of the biggest highs is having a kid. But life is about being balanced, right? You, you got a person that's chasing to win a championship, a Super Bowl, plays a movie, six months they're shooting. It's not a balanced life. So what is balance? Is this like certain balance is supposed to be nine to five? So you gotta know how to deal with contradictions as a CEO 
And you got to dance with contradictions, man. And don't be stiff when you're dancing with contradictions. Just kind of dance with contradictions and be okay with it when you're dealing with these contradictions. Because if you don't, you're going to have a lot of anxiety attacks and you're going to be having a lot of migraines if you try to control all these contradictions. Number seven, they think outside the box. Solid CEOs, they think outside the box. It's not always one way of doing anything. They think outside the box. Uh, they regularly think outside the box. One of the videos I did uh, uh, on thinking outside the box is, you know, how to think big as an entrepreneur. That's a video you ought to watch. It has to do a little bit with how to think outside the box. But they don't just look at one thing and say, we have to do this, 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 this. They're very good at looking at this saying, you know, connected dot, I think it's this far. Well, I never thought about that. Yeah, it's this, we need to focus on this. We've never done this before. And they're willing to think a little bit differently than most people would think. Number eight, they have a reputation. Let me explain what I mean by a reputation. They can't be pushed around by competitors. Um, typically, strong CEOs, I was watching this one president of a company, and he went up there, and he was being pushed around by Elizabeth Warren. And this, this is a financial firm company I was watching. And she was just pushing him and pushing him. And I'm sitting there, I'm saying, where is your spine? Stand up already. It wasn't Wells Fargo. I'm like, stand up already. Stand up for your industry. You're making, you're making everybody look like they're doing something wrong. Have some backbone. Say something. He's just sitting there like this, shaking, because he's worried about a $6 million bonus. Like, say something already. He's no longer the president. I wouldn't have him as a president. Voice your opinion a little bit. You can't be a CEO representing the industry and you don't have a backbone to share your thoughts and opinions because you're worried about regulators and the government. You gotta say some stuff a little bit. I'm not talking about being disrespectful, but you can't just sit there and take it all the time. A CEO can't be pushed around. You can't bully a CEO. They stand up, one of the most respectable CEOs I ever met was his name was Bob and Moshe. We established a relationship together. Uh, at our conference in 2015, I will never forget he died that night during our award ceremony, he had died that night. This is the CEO, former CEO of MetLife. He retires, very wealthy, goes to Croatia, Dubrovnik, which is my favorite place in the world, and he buys a vineyard. And all he does is make wine. And one day his son is over there, and it's 2008, AIG is about to go bankrupt. I'm having dinner with the CEO of AIG, David Herzog, and they call him. He says, hey, we need you to help us out. He said, I'm not coming. He said, we need you to help us out. I said, look, I'm good. He has three years to live. He's got cancer, he's dying. He's got three years to live. AIG calls him. Bob and Moshe gets up out of retirement, is on his deathbed, three years to live. Doctor says publicly it's on steroids all the time because he's dying, okay? He gets out of bed, not out of bed, he gets out of retirement, comes to AIG, starts working, promotes David Herzog, I believe from American General to AIG CFO. They go to the government, they ask for a $183 billion check. And when I'm having dinner, I'll never forget, they said every day we were getting hounded by regulators about our debt. Finally, Bob and Moshe calls, hey, this money we took from you, we're not like GM. We're gonna pay you back, but well, you're not gonna bully us on a daily basis. I'm gonna tell you right now, not a single call. I'm gonna let you know exactly what we're doing, but not one more single call. Whoa, okay. Bob and Moshe comes, sells off all the companies that they didn't need. Some of them he held a little bit longer to sell them. They own planes, Edge is a very big company. He pays back $183 billion plus another $23 billion in interest or so. Then he pays that back. GM still hasn't paid back. So many other people haven't paid back. AIG paid back. AIG's credibility comes back in the marketplace. Six months after that, he dies. It was a Friday night when this man died. And all I remember about Bob and Moshe, every time he and I were together, all I remember is a man with presence, with leadership, with backbone that people wanted to follow. He wasn't liked all the time. But there's one thing everybody knows, if that dude's at the helm, he's leading it as a CEO, you're gonna be fine. He's a general, the way he, read the, uh, he led the company. Not everybody has his personality, but generally strong CEOs, they can be pushed around. Next, number nine, they're great at asking questions. They're great at asking questions. Uh, when they don't understand something, they're gonna ask questions. When they wanna find out deeper issues, they know how to ask the right questions. A lot of times people don't ask the right questions. You can ask questions, but then it's asking the right question that gets the right answer that solves the bigger problem, not the smaller problem. Great CEOs are very good at asking the right questions. Study great CEOs on what questions they generally ask, and you'll tell yourself, man, I was thinking above the surface. This guy's thinking here. These are the questions I want to be asking about. That's what you want to be thinking about. Number 10, they want feedback. What do you think? What are your thoughts? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they know who to get the right feedback from, but it's constantly asking for feedback. Number 11, they raise standards. They're always raising standards. It's uncomfortable being around strong CEOs, great CEOs. They're always raising standards. Most people, believe it or not, don't even like working with great CEOs because it's not comfortable. 
it's always raising standards. It's almost a feeling of it's not enough. It's not enough. I mean, I thought we're doing, it's not enough. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. It's always a standard next. Every time I feel like I get somewhere, you move the marker. That's the job of a leader. Every time I feel like you go there, you move it a little bit more, man. Why, when are you going to be fully happy? Gets, that's, that's what makes them so special. That's why history books is going to favor Bob and Moshe. And when he dies, a bunch of people go and buy his book because they want to know what made him so special to save AIG from a major, you know, debacle or major issue that they were going to be facing. Right? Because they know how to raise everyone's standards. I remember we're in Napa Valley and Bob and Moshe walks in when there's a meeting going on. Everybody in that room that reported to him was uncomfortable. It's so funny just watching everybody. They were uncomfortable because he's a leader. He raised the standards. He told everybody, he said, this is how the meeting got started. And he had just become a CEO three months ago. He said, this Napa Valley thing, he told everybody, this is not going to happen for six years. We got money to pay back. We got money to pay back. That's how he started the meeting. This stuff, not happening anymore. We got money to pay back. And he looked at all of us and he says, hey, we know we haven't been good, but we need your business. We need your business. We need you to work with us. We need your business. Flat out. I said, I got a lot of respect for a man that talks like that and is very open about it. Number, number 12, they built strong alliances. Remember how I talk about humility? They built very strong alliances because, look, you can only go somewhere so far by yourself. Amazon, if you read Amazon's case study from Harvard, if you type in Amazon case study, and you type in Amazon, e, uh, e, um, uh, not e-toys, Toys R Us, right? If you study what Amazon did in 01, if Amazon doesn't build an alliance with Toys R Us, forget about Amazon. There is no Amazon. He gets credit for what he did with Toys R Us. So how did he do that? Building strong alliances. How did Steve Jobs, when he's about to go out of business, go to Microsoft, Bill Gates, his biggest enemy, and the meeting starts like this. We have been under this impression that in order for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. He says this in his talk. Just type in a Steve Jobs speech, Microsoft has to lose. He says this. He says that's not true. He had to go to Bill Gates and say, I need $300 million. Bill Gates, his biggest enemy, gives him $300 million. But imagine if he doesn't build that alliance. They're out of business. Everybody in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, saying a guy from here went to Seattle to raise money from the enemy. That's called building alliances. Today, you and I use our iPhone, our, our, all these other great devices, because somebody was strong at building alliances. Number 13, they speak different languages. What do I mean by that? I'm not talking English, Spanish, China, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking they speak different languages. Let me elaborate. They know how to talk to employees, different than the way they talk to executives, different than the way they talk to salespeople, different than the way they talk to investors, different than the way they talk to media, different than the way they talk to their family, different. They know how to speak this different, and let me tell you, it ain't the same language. It is not the same language. You cannot go talk to the front desk clerk at a company that you're the CEO and then talk to that person as if that person's a, you know, a full-on executive. You can't because it's a different language. So you got to know how to speak these different languages. You can't go to an investor and just kind of be lollygagging with them while they're expecting returns on the tens of millions of dollars that they give you. And I walk into these rooms. It's different conversations regularly. I did a video uh, that's called uh, Seven Different Audiences CEOs Talk To. I think it's Seven Different Audiences CEOs Talk. Let's put the tab up here. Edgar, making sure we put it up there in the link on the bottom. You have to watch this video. It's seven different audiences you'll speak to. That'll help you out on understanding how they speak to those different customers. Next, number 14. They know their strengths very well, but guess what? They know their weaknesses even more. Here's why. They're very comfortable being weak. They're so comfortable being weak. At least the great ones are very comfortable being weak. Because what they do with the weakness is they recruit the weakness. So whatever they're weak at, they bring somebody whose strength is in their weakness. Simple. And the sooner you identify your weaknesses, the sooner you're going to be able to leverage your abilities to focus on your strengths and not have to worry about your weakness. You can always recruit your weaknesses. By the way, everyone's got weaknesses. Focus on your strengths. Next point, number 15. They know what they know, and they know what they don't know. Let me say it again. They know what they know, and they know what they don't know. Similar to weaknesses, but it's not. Meaning... Whatever they don't know, they know the person who can get them to the answer of what they don't know. It's simple. So if it's a question technical, it's this phone call. If it's I know who to call to give me the answers to stuff I don't know about. And they're fine with it. So they know what they know and they know what they don't know. Number 16 is they're very decisive. They make the decision, boom. I had Tom the other day told me, he says, Pat, then when you want to fire somebody, you, it's like, that's quick. He says, I said, I'm good. I, the moment I know somebody doesn't fit in a stuff and I've seen a trend of three times, I'll typically give somebody three chances. But if I notice somebody's just not fitting and it happens like this over and over and over again, gone. They've got to go to a different place. It's like a relationship. That doesn't mean that person's a bad person. They're not going to fit in a place like this. 
because for whatever reason, this culture doesn't fit with that person and it constantly keeps coming back. That person may go to a completely different place and be happy, just not on this team. We have a certain set of culture here uh, that, we, that, we, that we have to follow through, that we follow through. Number 17, timing. Timing in business, timing in statements, timing in comments, timing in marketing campaigns, timing in breaks, timing on initiatives, timing on you know, fun uh, stuff for the associates and the employees and the sales. Everything's about timing. They're very good at timing. Number 18, they, they're very strong drivers. If there's an initiative, they will be driving it over and over and over and over again until you do it. They will drive the initiative nonstop. That's what makes these guys special. They drive. They're gonna drive the initiative. And, and the moment you thought they forgot about them, they're about to give you a speech on driving that initiative why everybody should be focused on that. They're nonstop drivers. And 19, last point here, they're very good at rallying the troops. They're very good at rallying the troops. They know how to get the troops going. If it's sales, if it's team, if it's home office, if it's support, they know how to rally the troops. So that's 19 different qualities of a great CEO. And by the way, if you're watching and saying, oh my gosh, I got a lot of work to do. All this stuff's gonna take years. Don't expect to be good at this over time. It's just good to look at it and say, I can improve in the following areas to become a better CEO myself one day where other people start looking at you as a CEO instead of just going out there and paying a couple hundred dollars and getting a Vista print business card just to call yourself a CEO. With that being said, you got any questions and thoughts? Comment on the bottom. If you have not subscribed to the greatest channel on YouTube for entrepreneurs, we need you to subscribe to the greatest channel on entrepreneurs. And we challenge you. I put it there out there to you. I put it there out there to you. Go tweet and message anybody else and see if they can stack against our channel on YouTube for entrepreneurs. We're that comfortable uh, uh, in what we're doing. We're constantly improving. We've got a lot of great initiatives that we got coming out here, but there's a lot of channels that are purely about motivation and regurgitating the same thing. We want to make sure we bring you fresh content and we're just getting started. Wait till you hear what's coming out here soon about stuff that's going to be just purely innovative that no one's ever done before uh, because we believe the world's a better place. The more entrepreneurs we can give birth to, the world just keep, keeps becoming a better and a better place. The more innovators, the more disruptors, this place keeps getting better and better and better. And we need your help to become a better entrepreneur. And we need your help to spread the message of value to other people. So if you haven't subscribed yet, click on the button here. And then right next to it, you see the notification. You'll be one of the first to get notified every time a new video comes out. Good catch. With that being said, thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.